Hello and welcome to season three, episode 24 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town, South Africa. We want to remind you all that all of our shows are recorded and available on YouTube. So if you miss out because of load shedding, you can always catch up later. And while you're there, please remember to click the subscribe button. Now tonight, our, viewer, our speaker needs no introduction to our regular viewers. Uh, Conservation Conversations creator and host, Dr. Melissa Whitecross, will be sharing her and the team's work on black stalks. But before we get to that, just a reminder to communicate with us using the chat and the Q&A feeds on Zoom or the comment feed on Facebook Live. And we'll answer the questions at the end of the webinar. We are active on all major social media channels and you can use the hashtag conservation conversations to let us know what you think of the show. And as, as always, thanks very much to the generous contributions towards our webinars, which, keep help, which help to keep these shows free for all to learn and enjoy. Please visit the Cricket page or EFT BirdLife South Africa directly and use the reference webinars and your name. Now, make sure not to miss out on the Cycle in the Bush event, our foray in, on two wheels into Big Five country in the Salati Game Reserve. This includes luxury accommodation and guided activities, as well as talks and interactions with BirdLife South Africa staff, including Melissa. There are limited spaces available, so please don't miss out. The proceeds of this will go to the Regional Conservation Program. And we'd also like to remind everyone about the 2023 Kruger Bird and Wildlife Challenge taking place from the 12th to the 19th of February, 2023, in partnership with Rock Jumper Birding Tours. Funds raised will go towards our White Wing Flufftail Conservation Project. And teams made up of South Africans who registered before the end of this month qualify for a discounted rate. Please visit Rock Jumper Birding's website to find out more and book your spot today. Now, finally, on to the main event. I'm very pleased to be hosting Melissa as the speaker tonight, and it's great to have her as a presenter rather than the host for a change. Melissa joined BirdLife South Africa in 2017 after completing her PhD at WITS. She became the Threatened Species Project Manager and coordinated projects on South Africa's threatened raptors and large terrestrial bird species, including the secretary bird, black stork, and the southern banded snake eagle. Melissa started as the new manager for the Landscape Conservation Program in January 2020, and she is doing a fantastic job. She is a passionate conservationist and an amazing birder, and she does so much for BirdLife South Africa from not only running the, the landscape conservation program and the many projects there, as well as helping out uh, with many other events and in initiatives. So she's a fantastic speaker and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what she has to share with us tonight. So Melissa, over to you. Thank you so much, Christina, for those very kind words and uh, right back at you. I think you're also one of our incredibly hardworking staff members out there. So uh, thank you as well for all you do. And uh, I'm just gonna check if you are able to see my screen. Is it coming through all right there? Yep, I can see it. All righty, fantastic. Well, uh, I guess we'll, we'll take it away then. Thank you, Christina. And good evening, everybody. Um, it's weird not to be saying hello and welcome to Conservation Conversations, but um, it's, it's fantastic to be with all of you uh, sharing the journey that uh, was one of the very first projects I got involved with at BirdLife South Africa all those years ago. Um, it's great to finally have some concrete science to present to you after our many, many hours in the field. And I'm going to give one quick caveat on this talk. Um, I found out that I would need to fill the slot about two weeks ago, and I had a bird fair workshop to put in between there. So <laughs> bear with me if I'm a little bit rusty as we present this evening but hopefully by the end of it, you will learn something about these incredibly elusive and beautiful birds. Um, they are notoriously shy, but as the chat feed uh, indicated, they are out there and people do see them. So let's talk a little bit about the status of South Africa's black stalks. But it would be remiss of me um, to not kick off with a thank you. I would not be standing here tonight if it were not for the many individuals you see on the screen, um, particularly Dr. Hanleen Smith-Robinson over here, our BirdLife South Africa Head of Conservation, and Linda Funden-Hefer, 
The two of them, with support from Neil Perrins, kicked off the Blackstalk project back in 2016, and it has slowly trundled along, and we finally got them to the point where we have some really interesting results to share with all of you. And uh, we've had several survey teams go out and, and do the hard work, and some amazing ornithologists, the likes of David Allen, Dr. Warwick Tarbiton, and of course, Andrew Jenkins, and new to the, the fold, Dr. Christian Brink and Alan Lee, who have really been the, the driving force behind some of the science I'll be sharing with you at the end of tonight's talk. But uh, a big thank you to all of them. And of course, as always, the Angular Partnership who helped fund my role on the Blackstalk project uh, all those years ago. And uh, these surveys don't happen without the support of our partners, the likes of Sand Parks and the Limpopo Parks. We are very lucky to have had some incredible field guides with us in the field. And I'd like to just single out Herman and Timane, who was on every single black stalk survey with me. I would walk behind this man in the bush for thousands of kilometers if I had to. He is so intuitive and so talented at what he does and kept us extremely safe. And I'll show you some of the close encounters we had the fortune of uh, experiencing while out on the Levuvu River. But just a, a massive thank you to every single one of them who trundled out onto the Levuvu River with us for many, many kilometers, keeping us safe and ensuring that we didn't walk into any buffaloes or elephants or hippos as one can when walking in the African bushveld. Okay, so the star of tonight's show, the Black Stalk, its scientific name is Siconia nigra, nigra for black, and uh, certainly a beautiful bird, that striking red bull. It is a very large stork, um, certainly uh, noticeable out on the water bodies of South Africa and Europe. And of course, that beautiful striking red bull, red legs and red eye ring that set it apart from some of the other similar stork species. A very white belly is also quite noticeable. And something to note about the black stork, while you can see them in flocks, they are often solitary or in pairs, moving around foraging. Not to be confused with the smaller abdoms stalk in Afrikaans, the Khrut Swart Oyefar is the black stalk, the bigger of the two, and the Klein Swart Oyefar being the smaller of the two abdom stalks. And really those defining features that separate these two birds apart besides their size the abdom stalk being almost half the size of a black stalk. Abdom stalks occur in big flocks, and you'll see that beautiful blue patch on the face um, with a little bit of red on the eye ring and a dull gray bull, not that striking red bull. Um, it can be confused with juvenile black stalks, which superficially look similar, but they lack that blue on the face and also those plainer pinkish legs rather than the red ones. And as I said, these birds come in uh, during the summer months into Southern Africa in their huge flocks, and they'll often be seen combing through many fields, um, whereas your black stalks tend to be more on the wetland and dam interface. So if you see a bird standing out in the middle of a field um, and it has a few friends, you're more than likely looking at an abdom stalk, not a black stalk. Size-wise, you can see the abdoms flying on the left there. At a quick glance, they probably do look quite similar with very similar undercarriages, those white patches on the belly and under wings. However, you can see on their faces yet again, the very obvious grayish bill of the abdom, abdom stalk and the red bill of the black stalk. Their legs are also a good way to try and tell them apart in flight. You can see the very pale pink legs of that abdom stalk versus your red legs on the black stalk. A wingspan of roughly one meter on the abdoms versus a meter and a half. Although that can be quite difficult to tell when the birds are flying at four or 500 meters above your head. Okay, not to worry too much about the, the complications of genetics. This is far over my head as well. But just to highlight down in the middle here, uh, the genus Siconia. Um, the closest being the marabou stalk genus, um, but other groups include your frigate birds, cape gannets, and other fish-eating um, birds that all fall into this larger family of water-loving species. Okay, geographically, now I saw 
Our honorary patron who's with us this evening, Pamela Isdell, is out in Switzerland and certainly not a bird that you will see too often in Switzerland. And that's largely because these guys are targeting forests up in Europe. And uh, I think Switzerland with its beautiful mountains probably doesn't have as many forests as the rest of Western and Eastern Europe. But uh, nevertheless, you can see a global distribution there, all those purple dots, the eBird information. Globally, we're looking at up to 44,000 individuals and the majority of those occur within Europe. Uh, somewhere between 19,500 to 27,800 individuals within that very densely packed European population. Closer to home, at the last estimate back in 2015 for the Red Data book, we have less than 1,000 mature individuals within South Africa, so a much smaller distribution. And we'll have a look a little bit more closely at those geographic separations in a moment. But as I said, if you are in Europe or Asia, you will be looking at the old growth undisturbed forests. And that can be anything from sea level right up into the mountainous regions through Europe and Asia. But certainly these birds look for these big trees. And that is also where they build their nests. You can see the three little white heads popping over a very large stick structure of the European black stalks. They have a pretty amazing uh, breeding display. Pairs will fly in tandem over the nests. And if you are looking for them in Europe, this can be quite difficult to observe given the very dense canopies one would need to look through. Closer to home where we have less forests, and I'll show you in a moment uh, what they, what the birds' habitat looks like in South Africa and elsewhere, we have a slightly clearer view as they saw over these mountainous regions. But you can see this bird flying on screen, a black outline to its tail. Um, this is typically what they look like when they are flying around, not displaying. When they start to display, they have some incredible undercarriage covets, which they can stretch out. You can see those white feathers showing up behind the bird. And uh, that is typically when they are showing off to each other flying in tandem above those nests. So I was lucky enough to observe this in the Michalisberg, and it is certainly a very interesting thing to watch these graceful stalks soar in tandem overhead. In terms of breeding, both parents get involved. Um, it is a family affair and eggs uh, measure up to approximately 70 millimeters, so seven centimeters, with between two to five chicks per clutch. And uh, anyone who's had the privilege of seeing a black stork nest will know that they are extremely obvious when you have two, three, four, five chicks on a nest and the adults, the whitewash is unmissable, like a beacon where they can fly into and, and find themselves. And you can see some of it on the edge of that nest next to those two chicks. Um, the biggest clutch ever recorded was six birds, but generally this is not the case overall. Um, on average, we're seeing more two to three clutches across much of Europe and South Africa. Eggs are laid approximately two days apart, and this is asynchronous hatching. So they hatch um, in the order that they were laid, um, and you'll find slightly bigger chicks on the nest with slightly smaller ones based on when they were laid and hatched. Incubation, as I said, is a family affair, both adults getting involved. And this can take anywhere from 32 to 38 days. And they will then go out and forage while the other adult sits on those nests. And fledging takes roughly two months. So 60 to 71 days for the young stalks to grow and develop and ultimately get off of the nest where they will then go out and start foraging with their adults and learning how to be effective black stalks. Unfortunately, as with most of our big birds in South Africa, we know that a lot of our large terrestrial birds have very low juvenile recruitment and juvenile survival, particularly within that first three years of life, which is how long it takes for a young black stork to reach breeding maturity. So only 20% of chicks in Europe, and I'm stressing that these data are all from Europe, we are still trying to figure out our statistics here in South Africa, but only 20% 20, 20 of these chicks will reach the breeding age of three years. And once they reach that period, 
Unfortunately, only 10% will make it over the age of 10 years old and 5% beyond the age of 20. It is a dangerous world out there if you are a large terrestrial bird like the black stork. They are capable of living long. In captivity, the longest recorded uh, lifespan was 36 years. So like many of our large birds, living for many decades. And that certainly does play a role in being a long-lived, slow reproducing species in terms of their survival and conservation. So let's drill into this geographic distribution a little bit more. As you can see at the top there, that big yellow swathe covering much of Northern Europe and into Asia, that is what we call the summer breeding range for our Northern Hemisphere black storks, largely based out of Europe and Asia. And these are the birds that are utilizing trees to build their nests. You can see that turquoisey color through the middle, that is their migration routes down into Africa, India, Thailand, and even South Korea. So all of these birds across their northern range will spend the northern hemisphere winter when it gets particularly cold and the lakes and water bodies which they rely on for food become frozen. They need to move down to warmer climes and they do it through a range of different migratory pathways. But something very interesting um, about the way that these birds move is that they tend to do it through very clear land bridges, as do many of our European migrants. And the wonders of tracking data enable us to really see where these birds are going. And there's this very interesting separation between your Western European birds that are going down through the likes of Gibraltar and the Iberian Peninsula through Spain and Portugal, the ones utilizing the uh, Italian route um, coming down through that shoe-like shape of Italy and crossing over into Tunisia and other parts of Africa. And then of course, the ones going down the central part of the Mediterranean, hopping over the, the countries near Turkey and various other um, central Mediterranean areas. We then have the Bosphorus birds coming out of Eastern Europe and Russia those yellow arrows, and you can see them all crossing down into the more central and eastern part of Africa. So very much a, a north-south movement by these black storks, and we learn a lot about the way they move, including the amount of space and area that they need when they are foraging in their summer and their winter territories. Now, this was a study carried out by Kano and his colleagues, and what he found was that the birds from the Iberian Peninsula, so these would be the birds coming down through that Strait of Gibraltar into West Africa, had much smaller foraging ranges within the Iberian Peninsula territories relative to their West African foraging grounds where they had much bigger foraging territories and were traveling anywhere from 10 to 30 kilometers a day in search of good food. Unfortunately, the study also showed that there was 30% mortality of these young birds in their first year coming out of Iberia and 50% mortality once they reached the breeding grounds in Africa. So a massive loss and die off as these birds try to make this arduous journey down to their wintering grounds. But there's something very interesting about the Iberian birds, and that is that the very Western distribution of black storks within the Iberian Peninsula are not using trees to nest and they are also not migrating. There is a resident population of black storks in the Iberian Peninsula who are cliff nesters and this is very interesting and presents a unique opportunity for an assessment of cliff nesters versus tree nesters. It's the only part of the birds range where this can be effectively done because both occur within this breeding distribution. So this is the Iberian Peninsula. You can see Portugal up to the left-hand side there and the various provinces of Spain. And all the gray dots within this map over here are your breeding birds within Spain. These are the breeding black storks. Now, what the study went and did was to look at uh, a rough estimate of breeding birds between April and May and compare the tree nesters with the cliff nesters. And they estimated back in 2013 that there were somewhere between 405 to 483 pairs. 
but they had access to a handful of those pairs. And what they found was they could run a very interesting comparison study trying to understand the impact of substrate. So that would be your trees versus your cliffs. And the little uh, symbols here help deline delineate those two um, types of nests. So the green ones over here are your tree nesters. And then of course, these black ones are your cliff nesters. And they looked at how many chicks were being born up the y-axis, so productivity, and how, what access level did humans have to these nests? So in areas where there was open access and people could get to the birds, um, how did that influence the productivity of these nesting stalks? And in areas that were restricted and people couldn't access them, what happened to the birds? And interestingly enough, they didn't find that much of a significant difference in terms of productivity against the substrates of these birds. However, they definitely found an impact of the cliff nesting birds that were in open areas. Areas where people were either climbing or hiking definitely led to a decrease in productivity for these black storks. So that's something that's really important to note. And this sensitivity of these cliff nesting birds to humans is a theme that's going to run through our entire talk tonight. But it's not only in the Iberian Peninsula where black storks are the cliff nesting resident species. We are lucky enough here in Southern Africa to also have a unique uh, cohort of black storks that are resident and breed on cliffs. And you can see a picture there taken in the Waterberg, a stronghold for the species back in the 80s. And uh, that is one of our vulnerable black storks. Um, globally, this species is considered least concern. Um, you can see the wide area that they cover. However, here in South Africa, regionally, they are considered vulnerable given their low numbers. Now, the first person to pick up that South Africa's black storks were doing something a little bit differently was our dear Siegfried back in 1967. And he published a fantastic document, uh, documentation of the distribution and status of black storks in Southern Africa. And what he noticed from the nests that he had access to and was keeping tabs on, was that our birds here in South Africa were breeding from May to September through the winter months of Southern Africa. And in summary, what he noted was that there was very clear evidence for this retention of black storks within South Africa's coldest period, which contradicted the consensus that these birds were migrating to Africa from Europe and he started to suggest that we may have our own resident subspecies that is taking advantage of these cliffs rather than the trees of Northern Europe that everybody was so convinced they were utilizing. Following on from dear Siegfried, we had Dr. Warwick Tarbiton, who was the Transvaal ornithologist and has done an insurmountable, amazing amount of work documenting the birds of the Transvaal through his incredible career. And he did a very comprehensive assessment of what was going on with the birds in this region back in the early 80s. And this was published in Ostrich as was Siegfried's paper. And I've just highlighted a little section here that he wrote in the summary. And he writes, it is a scarce but widespread breeding resident and most of its breeding habitat is in areas least affected by urban and rural development and population growth yet again indicating that these birds are actively avoiding humans from what we can pick up in where they are choosing to breed and occur. Now, as I said, if you are in Southern Africa, it is not the tall forested uh, groves that you will be looking for black storks in. We don't have many of those in South Africa, but we do have some absolutely breathtaking montane regions with enormous cliffs that these birds have adapted to and make use of. And I can honestly say there's nothing more spectacular than sitting on the top of a mountain and watching raptors and black storks fly past your eyes right at eye level. It is an extremely special experience and I'm absolutely blown away by this image that Albert Froneman was able to capture of this pair of black storks flying together. So as I said, Big mountains are where we'll find them, isolated remote valleys, the likes of the Sotpansberg, Drakensberg, and those Cape Fold mountains. 
They are also often associated with vultures. And I mentioned earlier in the chat that my last encounter with a black stork was when we were out in the Carnmark Sprayed Valley doing some assessments. Um, it is not uncommon to see a black stork come whizzing by in the vortex of vultures. And uh, you can see the top right image captured in the Michalisberg. Um, there are black storks breeding within the Skierport Cape vulture colony as well. And you can see a vulture and a stork having a near miss in the air there as they all try and take advantage of those early morning thermals. In terms of their foraging, these birds are fish eaters. So water is where you will find them. The estuaries of South Africa have been known to host black storks. And of course, those ephemeral pools that one so often encounters, particularly in the likes of Kruger National Park, the Karoo, and that Kalahari region when we have those unusually high rainfall periods. And uh, it was great to see that Christoph managed to connect with a few when he was out here traveling through that Kalahari region. But what they're looking for is the little fish that occur almost 80% of their diet, if not more, is made up of fish. And you can see some of the, the catfish species that are part of the Clarius genus that they are particularly fond of. But uh, being the opportunists that most of our birds are, they'll also occasionally make use of amphibians, insects, snails, crabs, small reptiles, mammals, and birds. But these guys are largely piscivorous and will opt to eat a fish above all else if the opportunity presents itself. They are also nomadic and will often be seen in these big flocks taking advantage of any good feeding conditions. And if you zoom in on the right-hand side there, those little black dots are about eight different black stalks that had all gathered together along the Tenzi River in Kruger Park one December after many of the juveniles had fledged off of their nests. And it was a very exciting sight to behold given that earlier that year, I had not seen any black stalks on our survey. So it was very good to see that they were still around. Unfortunately, they do face a number of different threats. Uh, anything relating to habitat loss that we know is the ultimate challenge for all our biodiversity, trying to learn to live alongside our innate ability to transform everything around us. Damming of rivers plays a massive role in eliminating viable foraging habitat for these birds that are so well adapted to walking through shallow mountain streams. They really do struggle to get access to fish swimming near the surface when we build these big dams. Pollution, plastic, toxins flowing into rivers all play their part in making those river systems a challenge for these birds, be it by either eliminating the fish and other biodiversity that rely, uh, that this bird relies on, or through bioaccumulation and potentially taking up of toxins within these river systems. There is still a lot more research to be done on that front, but it is certainly something we are very concerned about. Hikers and recreational activities moving into areas that weren't necessarily um, high traffic regions in the past does play a role. And we'll talk a little bit more about the influence of ecotourism on these elusive birds in the later slide. And of course, not so much in the South African population, but very much in the European population, that loss and conversion of old growth forests into these rapidly growing plantations that are just not suitable for these birds that require those big old mature forest trees. And the ultimate culprit, our expansion of people converting much of our landscape into settlements. And with that comes the need to produce food. And there is a lot of documentation of persecution and human wildlife conflict particularly around our trout farms and various other aquaculture going on around the world. So some of the threats, uh, certainly a lot more facing this poor species, but these are the major ones. And another study which really just highlighted the fact that these birds are not big fans of people. Um, the tracking study run by Damien Chevalier and his colleagues looked into the impacts across their wintering range in Africa trying to understand the interplay between the presence of people and this huge threat that we face in Africa of our river systems and our water drying up 
as Africa becomes more arid with the heating that we are experiencing in the world. And uh, these incredible tracking studies really highlighted the fact that these black stalks are actively avoiding where people were and really being put under pressure by this lack of available foraging habitat with the drying up of water systems, yet either because people have drawn out the water for irrigation purposes or for various other means, damming up of rivers upstream and various other issues. And then of course, the big one in the room, the monster that is climate change, the incredible team at Durham University with our very clever colleagues at BirdLife International have managed to run climate change distribution maps and models for several of our threatened species across the world. What you will see on the right hand side of your screen are the predictions going through 2025, 2020, uh, 2055 and 2085. So moving along over the next couple of decades, certainly within the lifetimes of some of us and uh, very scary to see just how things can change. So on the left hand side, you've got the purple dots showing the present distribution. You can see these birds actively avoiding the desert regions and those very heavily forested parts of uh, Africa, which is interesting given that they seek them out in the northern parts of their range. But if we look at 2025 initially, what you will see here is anywhere with a light dot is a good thing. That means that the birds will still be there in the future as well as currently. Anything with a dark green dot means that this will be an expansion. This is the area that these birds are going to need to move into to survive as the areas marked out by the purple dots become unsuitable. So anything in purple on the right hand side is a concern and that is where the birds will no longer occur as things change. So moving forward into 20, 2055, you can see a lot of that Okavango Delta region starting to become suitable, which is very interesting and may play a massive role in trying to conserve these Southern African birds. And then of course, as we move all the way into 2085, much of their current range becoming unsuitable across the Northern parts of South Africa and the Southern limits of their ranges in West Africa and East Africa. So an interesting prediction, certainly concerning and hopefully our conservation teams in the various range states will be taking note of where we need to be building resilience in our protected area networks for these incredible birds. From a conservation point of view, it is a recognized AWA species. For those of you who have not come across AWA, this is the Convention on Migratory Species, specifically the African Eurasian Waterbird Agreement. And if you've ever listened to any of our talks on the white-winged flufftail, that is another species which is recognized under the AWA Convention. And it does provide a lot of support in driving partner states across the entire range of these migratory birds to try and work together to do holistic conservation. There are various other um, annexes and, and other mechanisms in place, the likes of Wetlands International, who have set up a conservation action plan for the species in Europe. And of course, uh, that poster there being pulled together by the AWA team to try and raise awareness for this incredible bird. Closer to home, our birds are recognized through the National Biodiversity Acts and the top species being one of our threatened species. But uh, we certainly need to do a lot more to try and protect all of our birds. Um, and those of you who tuned in last week to hear our policy and advocacy team, um, they certainly did uh, do a fantastic job of showcasing some of the legislative mechanisms that are out there. But let's bring it a bit closer to home. So, BirdLife South Africa's uh, engagement with the black stork started back in 2016 after the red list of Southern, African, Southern Africa's birds came out and it was indicated that the black stork was one of our vulnerable water bird species. And as I said, my colleagues Hanaline and Linda started off trying to figure out what we needed to take on to try and get a better handle on how to save these magnificent water birds. So as I said, that red list came out. And so there were three points highlighted at the end of the red list assessment for our black storks, which put them into the vulnerable category. And the first one was this lack of information around the population and status of the species in Southern Africa. The only comprehensive national status 
was that 1967 assessment by Siegfried. And certainly the technology and the information that we had on the species had come a long way since then, but really did require some dedicated work to try and collate everything. Um, Tarbiton's assessment of the northern population certainly helped, but we needed this comprehensive look. They also highlighted the need for genetics to be compared with Europe. Unfortunately, we have not got that far as yet, but hopefully one day soon, we'll be able to convince one of our academic institutions who are interested in these population genetics to consider the black stork as an important species for assessment. And of course, trying to look at those local scale movements within the subregion. We've seen some amazing tracking data through the European population, and hopefully one day soon we will start to get some tracking devices out to understand how these amazing nomads are moving and utilizing our water bodies. So just to reiterate, we needed to understand what was going on with our South African birds, particularly around their breeding season. And being cliff nesters, we knew that we needed to target some very mountainous terrain. And the peak egg laying period is somewhere between May to August. So we decided that trying to target these areas in August, sort of when there would definitely be chicks on the nest if they had bred successfully, we decided to make that our target period. And of course, while we were there, we were always going to collect some other data on some of their co-occurring birds. So we had this amazing map by Warwick Tarbiton from the 1980s that we could work off of. And this is the Northern Kruger National Park. And I hope that most of you on this call have at least heard of that jewel of South Africa's conservation. But uh, the Levuva River that runs through the northern boundaries and western boundary of the north of Kruger was really our targeted space. This is an incredible river system that cuts through enormous granitic cliffs, making some of the most dramatic and jarring landscapes you can find in northern Kruger National Park. Certainly the likes of Lana Gorge, I'm sure those of you who know about it will concur. But all of those little orange dots are the historic black stork nests that Dr. Warwick Tarbiton had collected. And this was really what we had to go on. No one had gone looking for these birds uh, beyond the 1980s survey. And we wanted to know, A, are they still there? Because this was the highest density of black storks recorded in South Africa ever. Um, some birds as close as two kilometers within this stretch of river. So we put together some survey teams, a motley crew of raptor biologists and ornithology enthusiasts, and off we went. And uh, we certainly learned a lot over the three years. It was my privilege to be able to attend every single one of these surveys and it really was a fantastic partnership with Sand Parks. And as I said, Herman on the left and right of your screens, just an absolute trooper guiding us so expertly as we went about our business trying to find where Kruger's black stalks were. So when one becomes a researcher in Kruger, you get to don your car with the amazing Kudu Corp magnets. And we were very proud to stick them on our Ford Wildlife Buckies. And off we went, bird watching stickers at the ready and a lot of pre-dawn exits to try and get to those clips as early as possible and see what was happening. There were a lot of late nights trying to translate what we'd seen on the ground and figure out our next move in this unknown territory. And you can see lots of finger pointing and trying to figure out how to get to some of these uh, spots. Often we would have a Jeep track that dropped us in a good two or three kilometers from the cliff system that we wanted to get to. And we had to try and navigate the contours of these topographic maps to figure out our best entry point that minimized our walking and maximized our time at the cliffs. And I'm just gonna show you some incredible vistas of what we encountered while we were there. In the top left of your screen, the famous Lana Gorge. If you have not had the privilege of going to Lana Gorge and you are a Kruger enthusiast, if you have to sell your car to get there, do it. It is a breathtaking place. I would highly recommend anybody who has the ability to see Lana Gorge, go and visit this unbelievable site. A raptor paradise and certainly a spot for black storks. And that wasn't the only amazing place we got to see. Many other cliff systems and rivers were traversed in search of these wonderful black stalks of the Levuvu River Valley. It also did not come without its challenges. Uh, yes, these are crocodile-filled rivers. And yes, we did have to walk through them 
at one point getting thigh deep. So it was uh, without, not without its hairy moments, but we did our best to be as safe as possible and move through in cohorts. And uh, as you can see there, Kyle Walker quickly crossing um, after getting distracted by a smaller sipita in the tree behind him. But um, an, an incredible experience being able to walk along the Levuvu River and walk in the Levuvu River and in the areas that were nice and shallow and you didn't feel too threatened by the crocodiles, it was a welcome reprieve from the sometimes 35 to 40 degree heat in the middle of winter. Those cliffs really do bake you in that central river zone. I mentioned some of the close encounters. Uh, the Nile crocodiles were prolific, but uh, we certainly did our best to avoid the deeper pools where they seemed to take up occupancy, as did the hippopotamuses that would regularly snort in our direction if we got too close. And I remember one very heart stopping moment as we came down a sand bank and there happened to be a very deep pool with a male hippo in it who had snorted his displeasure at us being there. And uh, what we had failed to see was that there was also a very large crocodile between the hippo and us. And as we came down off of the sand bank, a good 20 or 30 meters from the edge of this pool, the hippo moved forward in the water, giving the crocodile a big scare. And all we heard was this tidal wave and a big splash. I have not seen six people uh, move in a two-step motion so fast. The only one standing is ground, dear Herman, who is the bravest man I've ever seen. And uh, he did give us a good chuckle saying, I told you whatever you do, don't run. So luckily none of us did. We just did a very quick two-step and uh, no harm came out of that situation. But you really do recognize your place on the food chain when walking through the African bush vault. Lots of ellies, um, water being such a, a scarce resource during winter, we encountered many and Herman expertly navigated us around them. At one point, uh, getting rather close to a sleeping matriarch whose herd was down in the river, we unfortunately were forced to walk between her and her herd but uh, we did it in a very safe manner and Herman, just a, another testament to his ability to read the bush, got us through there without any harm or we would have been stuck there for a good few hours as she took her afternoon siesta. The evidence of leopards and carnivores everywhere you walked, we often found carcasses up in trees or on the ground. And uh, yet again, just reminding you not to get too comfortable. Um, there was a lot of sitting and watching and as you can see the little lizard between my legs there, taking advantage of a sunny patch. And uh, it was quite amazing just to have that time in nature, watching for these incredible birds that come out of the nooks and crannies of these cliff systems. Baobab forests, river gorges, sandbanks, an unbelievable landscape to walk through and survey. And one quite can't believe what is hidden within these cliff systems and river gorges until you set foot into them. A really, really special part of the world. And what a privilege to be able to walk through there and look for the um, unbelievable biodiversity that was on offer. We birded hard, many hours behind binoculars and scopes, staring at cliff faces, watching for the faintest bit of, mo of movement. It is unbelievable how well these birds can hide away stationary on a large cliff face. And don't be fooled, those cliffs in front of the three gents on the left-hand side of that screen are a good 200 if not 300 meters high in some places. And there's a lot to look through in trying to find the different birds that are hiding away on them. But our search continued and we worked high and low, all different habitat types along the Levuvu, trying to find our beautiful black stalks. And while we did it, there was a lot of good bycatch. Winter happens to be a very good breeding time for many of our raptors. So we did some extra bonus vulture nesting surveys and also managed to find some beautiful breeding bears, eagle owls, and even secretary birds, which was definitely one of the highlights of my trip. And then we managed to find some black stalks, which was a huge relief and uh, certainly a good step in the right direction. Unfortunately, the ones we saw, as you can see by those tail feathers, were likely not quite breeding it. So we didn't see any nests, but certainly these two birds were interacting and making the right noises, singing to each other in a very interesting high-pitched whistle. And uh, we carried on through the gorge in search of more. 
And then we got to Lana Gorge and something very interesting happened in Lana Gorge in the very first 2017 survey. You can see Anthony in the top there. We were stationed just around the bend from the bottom photograph. At this bend is a pair of various eagles. They have actively been there for many years. You can tell by the, the two eyries, uh, big stick nests that they have constructed over the decades. And on the other side of this very jarring iron-like uh, triangle of rock was what we thought and had heard word of maybe a possible black stork nest. So we were very excited to do the six kilometer hike it took to get to this point to try and see if we were able to spot the black stalks of Lana Gorge. But something very strange happened while we were there. And to this day, I still scratch my head trying to understand exactly what we witnessed. While we were sitting watching from the usual spot at the top of Lana Gorge, right across that valley towards that triangle that I pointed out, we had very clear evidence of some kind of next nesting structure just around the corner from where we could see effectively with our scopes. And while we were sitting there, we noticed a very large female black uh, Vero's eagle come flying in and land next to that structure. So we got a little bit concerned because she clearly started feeding. And as that happened, a black stork came flying in and desperately tried to chase her off of that nesting ledge. Uh, sadly, to no avail, there was some insane acrobatic flight as the female Vero's eagle expressed her displeasure at being disturbed. And uh, it wasn't too long before both various eagles returned to that perch, which I sadly suspect may have been the black stork chick that might have been eaten. We cannot confirm this for certain, but it certainly looked that way. And given the prolific presence of various eagles throughout this gorge, which I'll show you in a moment, the noticeable lack of black stork nests was very, very concerning for us. So in 2017, we didn't find any active black stork nests. We did see birds, but no breeding. And just to bear in mind, this was when Kruger was coming out of that horrific drought. So that certainly could have played a, a role. But one of the very interesting things we noticed was these blue triangles and just how many various eagles we were seeing within the Levuvu Valley. Certainly a very concerning uh, faction when you try and think that we are looking for black storks that seem to be a prey option for these behemoths. Various eagles. We confirmed them um, at these five points, the, the yellow ones being pairs that we noticed flying together. Uh, we had confirmed various eagle nests along that Levuvu Valley, almost seeming to replace some of these black stalks in 2017. But then it was time to return. Um, we exchanged our raptor biologists for two very keen bird life staff members, Fanny Dupassi and Ernst Ratif. And off we went, uh, a lot of knowledge under our belt from the previous season, but uh, certainly still lots of questions to be answered. So we headed off as once again, lots of good bycatch, a few new routes to try and explore and uh, some beautiful birds, Dickinson's kestrel in the top there, lizard buzzard, and of course, more breeding vultures. We also managed to connect with some other awesome birds, uh, yellow-billed stork, uh, collective, nests in heronries was fantastic. We even found a Swainson spurfowl nest, those two little white eggs over there. And the little fluff in your bottom left is a baby double banded sand grouse, one of the cutest things I've ever seen. So fantastic time to see all the animals bouncing back in 2018 um, with the rains that had come after that horrible flood. We also decided to try a slightly new approach to the Levuvu Valley. Now I mentioned that the Levuvu River forms the western boundary of northern Kruger and you can see the Makuya Nature Reserve which I'll point out to you in a moment running along that northwestern section of Kruger National Park and this is a very different side it's a heavily vegetated very steep narrow gorges um, even steeper and narrower than Lana Gorge but some really beautiful habitat to try and survey and some lovely pools for black stalks to forage. So that is the area of uh, Makuya Nature Reserve. You can see the faint orange outline there within that orange dotted circle. Um, and we decided to try and explore some of the Levuvu Valley from the other side of the river to see if we could see anything different. When we started, unfortunately, we were still finding nests that did not have anybody home down in this bottom section of the 
the screen over here, you'll see some whitewash that was one of Warwick's historic nests, sadly abandoned. But we continued walking and came to this incredible section of cliff. And uh, those of you with eagle eyes may have noticed this tiny patch of whitewash at the bottom here. And that got us extremely excited because at last, what we found was a bird sitting on a very heavily whitewashed cliff. And when we stuck our scope up, we had found it a, an active black stalk nest with an approximately 30 day old chick. I think the bellow of excitement I let out was probably a little too loud, but uh, Linda very quickly shushed me and we excitedly gave each other a good thumbs up. And our amazing colleagues that had traveled with us from Makuya, some of the Limpopo interns, all got to enjoy this incredible celebration with us and much celebrating when we got back to camp. Uh, having walked probably close on 60 kilometers at that point and not seeing a black stalk, we were very relieved to finally have an active nest and know that the stronghold of the species was not quite gone yet. And I think this also presented an amazing opportunity for us as the team to do some engagement with these incredible interns who happily tagged along and trudged along to the tops of these cliffs with us. Um, we were very, very lucky to have Ernst on the trip, an avid atlaser and bird lasser teacher. And Ernst showed our two interns exactly what to do when it came to how to identify birds in the field, and how to use their phones to keep track of what they were seeing. And I think through that internship, we have two new birders in the Limpopo province who will hopefully continue to monitor what is going on in that Makuya region. We also were lucky enough to work with the African Ivory Route who very kindly let us stay in Matale Falls. If you have not uh, been out to Makuya Park, I can highly recommend this um, beautiful, rustic, remote safari tent des destination. And we were lucky enough to be able to give them a full set of African bird life up to 2019, as well as a few bird guides and bird books to help their growing interest in AV tourism and conservation within that region. And it was just so refreshing to engage with people on the ground who are keen to know more about their birds. But if we summarize three years of black stalk surveys, what did that look like? Up in the top right, 2017, we had two active encounters of black storks, one being that of Lana Gorge, the other, those earlier uh, birds doing breeding flights as one entered the Lana Gorge system. Um, so very interesting to, to encounter those two birds. Sadly, we did not find any others on that trip. 2018 was definitely our best year yet. We had eight adults and one chick, um, and these were observed during our 2018 survey, if we put that on a scale, we had about 1.4 individuals per 10 kilometers in 2017, and roughly 1.8 individuals in 10 kilometers in 2018. Unfortunately, we only had one bird observed in 2019. So very slow going in the final survey. But uh, one of the questions that really caused us to scratch our heads was, we've got this near perfect habitat for our black stalks in the north of Kruger. What on earth is going on? And as I said, we often leave these trips with more questions than answers, but these were some of our hypotheses. So trying to understand the water quality of the Levuvu River. I know the Sand Parks team have done some incredible work looking at the catchment of the Levuvu, the unbelievable rates of transformation to agriculture, human settlement, and various other issues along that catchment, which all filter into this river system and can cause challenges for the biodiversity relying on it in our national parks. It was a big flood back in 2013. Could that have potentially altered some of the structure of this Levuvu and the flow paths through these river systems? We also know that there's been a huge increase in tourism within the Makuleke concession, and this increase in foot traffic up and down the river system could potentially be playing a role. We know these birds do not like people, and we know that the only time one can hike the Levuvu is in winter when they are breeding. So that presents a big challenge for our tour operators to try and balance taking tourists into this unbelievable place, but minimizing the, di the direct impacts that they have by being there. We also had that knock-on effect from the drought. 
back in 2014, 15, 16, we had huge droughts within North and Northern Kruger, and that might have caused a lot of our breeding attempts to, to fail. We know that breeding in our black stork population is tied to rainfall, and perhaps these birds took a few years off trying to just survive these very dry conditions. There also appears to be this competition for cliff nesting sites. And uh, certainly with the uptick in Barrow's eagles, it was interesting to see maybe there's this shift of other more dominant species taking over from the shyer, less aggressive black stork. And then of course, the bigger longer term challenge of climate change. We know that the broader Limpopo Valley region is drying up. We are seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Those of you who spent time in Kruger in the early 90s to now will notice how much drier that northern part of Kruger is. And of course, these being water-loving fish-eating species, that presents a big challenge for our black stalks. But at the end of the day, we are a conservation organization. And the last part of my talk is going to show you how we translated some of this field research into meaningful conservation information. And one of the first things we started doing was collecting black stork nesting records from wherever we could. Um, a wonderful team of volunteers out birding. Whenever they came across a black stork nest, they would let us know. We started adding that to a database and my colleague Robin Pillane started to quantify our river systems on high suitability and low suitability in terms of where we might expect to find some of these black storks. But hot off the press and undergoing review at the moment, and I'd like to just put that big caveat out that this is currently being reviewed and cannot be taken as absolute fact, but I'd really like to commend Alan on the incredible amount of science that he's done to pull together what we translated from on the ground into a meaningful population and status assessment of our black stalks in Southern Africa. So thank you, Alan, and a big thank you to Christian who also helped drive that process of getting this paper together after many, many years. So we had this incredible resource of historical nesting data, the likes of Warwick Tarbiton, David Allen, Andrew Jenkins, all happily sharing their nesting sites with us. And we could then take those nesting records and start to build what we call habitat suitability models. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, I'm going to quickly use our Southern Banded Snake Eagle habitat suitability modeling slide. So please excuse Northern Positive Natal. But uh, essentially, we can collect point location data. That is a GPS point with a time and a date stamp that tells us the location of a bird in a given period. We can collate all of those points into a meaningful species map. And with a little bit of clever elimination so that we account for territory presence, we can then clean up our input data. This is the data that go into a model and tell us where these birds occur. Using that, we can then start to compare that presence data with different elements from the environment. And that can be anything from the broad levels of climate data, things like rainfall, temperature, humidity, with topography, how steep is the area? Are there a lot of cliffs? Is it a river valley versus the top of a mountain? And we can use those different elements with land cover. What is the land use? Is it farming? Is it settlement? Is it natural? Is, it, uh, is the soil type different in the different areas? And we can build all of these together into what we call a habitat suitability model. And at the broader scale, we start off by doing that with just climate layers, but then we can really start to pull all of them together to try and understand what is going on with these birds. So the modeling process is complicated. We don't need to understand it for now, but essentially with a bit of data cleaning and understanding a bit about the ecology of the species and what it needs, we know this bird likes mountain systems and rivers. So we have to make sure that we capture that data. We can feed all of that together to spit out a layer which shows us high probability in blue and green and low probability in yellow. So what does that look like for our black stalks? We did two models, the first being a breeding habitat suitability model. And this really targeted our cliffs and high lying areas being the most uh, important predictors for where our breeding birds are going to occur. We know our birds need those um, topographic features to be able to breed. So that is very obvious that things like the Michalisberg, the Drakensberg, the Sotkansberg, all coming out strongly um, as important uh, black stalk breeding habitats. And even a few through 
that Cedarburg region. Overall, and in blue there, you can see the area predicted just over 300,000 kilometers of potential black stork breeding habitat. So certainly not a habitat availability issue when it comes to breeding habitat for these birds. We then wanted to understand what was going on while they are feeding in South Africa. This opens us up to a much broader range of areas. We know that these birds can take advantage of anything from an eph ephemeral pan to the, the big systems like your Orange River. You can see snaking through the middle of the Northern Cape there coming up in blue, as well as our estuarine systems along the coast and those major river systems through Kruger really lighting up. And all the little squares you can see across here are our SABAP2 data where we have had presence records of black stork, just helping to inform whether our model was on track or not. If we had SABAP points that weren't hitting the model, we needed to refine it even further to try and ensure that we were predicting the most suitable habitat for these birds. And it was a no brainer that of course, drainage lines and wetlands were the most important element in this model. But an interesting one was that of mean temperature in the coldest month. So really targeting those high altitude areas um, that get particularly chilly um, for a lot of these cliff nesting black stalks. When we start to look at our amazing data set that we have in the Southern African Bird Atlas project, the first one took place from 1987 to 1991, covering much of South Africa in a very broad swathe. We can compare that to our modern day SABAP2 project, which has been running since 2007, and it can tell us a lot about how the distributions of birds have changed. And once again, just a massive thank you to every single one of you that has submitted an, an Atlas card irrespective of whether it had a black stalk on it or not, all of that data helps us infer where these birds are and where they are not. So what you have on screen here is really the comparison between these two things. On the left-hand side with those bar graphs, what you can see here are the number of quarter degree cells that had black stalks in them during SABAP1 and not during SABAP2. Unfortunately, we can see a massive number that were absent in SABAP2 that had black stalks initially in SABAP1. When we talk about reporting rates, that is the frequency at which one encounters a bird in a pentad based on the number of cards that have been recorded. But essentially, if you have a high reporting rate, that means that the bird is frequently present and frequently seen. Low reporting rates mean that they are not being seen as often and likely are less abundant. So definitely a high proportion showing a decline in the encounter rates of these birds in our pentads. Crossing to the other side, we do see a handful of pentads with new records that were not picked up in the first SABAP one, maybe speaking a bit to those changes in climatic conditions, birds moving into areas that weren't suitable in the early 80s, but have become suitable now in present day. And you can see on the right there, some of that captured with those red areas showing the really big declines in where birds were seen. In terms of just a, a geographic scope and abundance inference, um, this is some very clever modeling that Alan has done, but the, the layman's version here really is that when we look at our distribution of black stalks from the west on the left-hand side of that graph to the east of the country, we see a much higher proportion of birds during the non-breeding season in the west of the country. And I think that translates very clearly in the foraging model where we can see these birds moving into the broader region as those summer rainfall areas come online um, to go out and forage after being confined to their breeding cliffs on the more eastern side of the country. We can also look within Kruger Park and outside of it Interestingly, we don't see that much of a difference um, across the years. It does seem to be relatively stable in the areas that have been monitored through SABAP. Um, but very interestingly, what we do see is that within Kruger Park, there is definitely a higher reporting rate. We obviously know there are a lot more birders atlasing more regularly within Kruger, so that definitely plays an impact, but it certainly is a key place for these birds to persist particularly within the boundaries of our national park. And just to highlight here an interesting dip that we saw over the years, um, you can see from 2008 up to 2021, really, really good 
um, in the sort of mid to early um, 2000s, but through that horrible drought from 2016, a clear dip in the reporting rate as those birds would have had to move off to other areas where they would be able to find fish after many of the river systems had dried up in Kruger. Within our breeding range, obviously we do see um, a decline in the reporting rates overall. So this is moving from 2008 up to 2022 across the whole range. Um, while this is a very small decline, it is still one that is notable and something that we do need to be careful of um, in alerting us to the challenges that may lay ahead. And just something, probably the crux of this work, and uh, I'm going to use arrows for some very complex modeling, because uh, Alan is probably a much better place to explain the intricacies of it. Essentially, what we can do with the data that we have in SABAP2, as well as our habitat suitability models, and this is something that we'll be applying to our future red listing processes, is to look at the potential carrying capacity based on the areas that are coming up as suitable. So we know that roughly there are 10 birds within a pentad at an absolute maximum. How do we translate that into pentads with birds present? And what does that look like for the population of South Africa's storks? We know from our overall breeding carrying capacity data that we could have anything from 900 to 2000 birds in terms of available habitats. But when we actually start building in that presence data and putting it through some clever modeling, unfortunately, we are looking at the reality where we have only 300 pairs, roughly, within South Africa, Lesotho, and Eswatini. And what does that mean for the conservation of the black stork? If we look at the population up the y-axis, so that's your vertical one, this was roughly around 950 birds back in 1990. A mere 30 years later, the reality is that we are down to probably about 600 birds, squeezing the black stork just within the remit of the endangered conservation category against that population criteria A to B of the IUCN assessment framework. A very big red flag for the black stork in South Africa. So just some concluding remarks coming out of our study, um, and I'll, I'll use these to finish off. Black storks are long lived creatures. And as such, the slow declines we are observing in the SABAP2 data are indicative of a population which is not losing many adults, and we can see that from the stable reporting rates on the known territories, but it is clearly failing to recruit significant numbers of these juveniles. And if the European rates of mortality are anything to go by, I'm sure our birds are undergoing similar pressures. Given that climate change models are projecting a drier future for South Africa, and we're already seeing that, particularly in the north of Kruger, it appears that our breeding birds being tied to rainfall, we should certainly be concerned for South Africa's black storks. And uh, with that, I hope that you all enjoyed learning a little bit more about these elusive birds. We by no means have all the answers on how we are going to save them. There are a lot of theories, a lot more work is needed. We will continue to try and understand what we need to do to save them. But just a massive, massive thank you to the many, many people who have contributed to us being able to do this study, come up with this initial assessment and start laying the groundwork for getting a better handle on what is going on with South Africa's black stork population. And as always, that army of SABAP2 atlases, please continue submitting your data. And thank you everybody for listening. I'm more than happy to take a few questions and I will do my best to answer them not being a black stork expert. Thank you so much, Christina. Great, thanks so much, Melissa. That was that was a very good talk, um, very comprehensive, covering uh, black stork bio biology and uh, the amazing surveys that you and the team have done. As I said at the beginning, I'm very jealous of those surveys, um, but also quite a quite a worrying and sober talk, uh, sobering talk, I should say. Um, so it's great to see that black storks are on the radar and. Uh, you've got that paper coming out soon, hopefully, uh, with your latest uh, studies. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll dive into some questions. Or before we do, um, just to remind everyone to please join us again next week, uh, where we're heading back to our city birding uh, series. Uh, 
at, with the talk about birding in Nelspruit or Mbombela. Great, so the first question, um, maybe starting kind of with their, their biology and maybe no one knows the answer to this, but Penny Abbott asks whether there's any indication uh, in as to how these birds became cliff nesters in Africa versus forest nesters in Europe. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Penny, for that great question. Um, I personally am not 100% sure and uh, would welcome anybody in the chat room who has any theories about that. Um, it definitely seems that at some point, um, and likely when Africa's more montane habitats were a little bit more linked, these two uh, offshoots of birds found it much easier not to, to migrate and to move onto these cliff systems often associated with these um, free flowing water bodies that did not dry up. And uh, the birds seem to have adapted really well to that um, and establishing substantial populations in Southern Africa and, and Europe, um, or oh, sorry, in the Iberian Peninsula. But uh, I, I don't have the exact reasons for it. And please, uh, Christina, if anybody does pop anything into the chat that, that could speak a bit more to that. Um, I think this is a, a biogeography researcher's um, proverbial wet dream, if we can call it that. So anybody <laughs> looking for some projects, uh, I think the genetics and the evolutionary history of these, these resident populations is something that is needed and would be a fascinating topic to take on. So if you're out there looking for something to do, there is a challenge. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's always um, interesting to try and tease out the differences between, you know, differences in the same species, uh, species in different parts of the range. Um, now we have a question from Kish Chetty, who I know is a, a great collaborator with BirdLife South Africa, um, asking about whether we have enough data to use remote sensing or other spatial modeling uh, to determine habitat suitability, including rainfall in relation to future climate change adaptation so we can prioritize future protected areas of their habitat. Thanks, Kish, great question. And yes, I do believe that we, we do have those capabilities. Um, obviously, every model is only as good as the data coming into it. Um, we can certainly try our best to predict what is going to happen, but that is not necessarily always going to be the case. But I think South Africa is certainly a world leader when it comes to having a fairly decent idea of what global change has in store for us, particularly when it comes to rainfall. Um, the, the sort of average take on it is that our Drakensberg regions are going to become wetter um, and very concentrated with their rainfall. Are we even beginning to see some of that with the, the likes of the KZN floods we've already seen? Um, but the, the central interior and high felt of the country is going to become a lot drier and less rain filled. And that's certainly going to play havoc on a species that takes advantage of these ephemeral pan systems that spring up during the summer rainfall months. Um, but it's, it is an important thing for our conservation networks and protected areas to factor in. And I think for the most part, um, those conversations are being had and where those data are available, they are being incorporated, but an excellent, an excellent suggestion there. Great, thanks. And now Rob Simmons uh, asks, he unfortunately missed the first part of the talk and whether you can just recap the correlation between breeding and rainfall which you've touched on a little bit in that previous answer. Yes, thanks, Rob. Um, once again, not, not the expert here, but from the literature and what we've observed through Siegfried, Tarbertons and our own um, analyses is that certainly in years where rainfall is better, um, our breeding birds do um, seem to, to be more prolific. And they suspect that that is likely due to food availability. So we know that um, much of semi-arid South Africa's ephemeral pans and various other wetland systems um, coming online right when these young black stalks are fledging off of their nests just gives them that much more of a chance to survive and also makes it easier for the adults to feed them while they are on the nest. Um, so the, the good rainfall years definitely seem to drive better breeding, at least in the historical records that we have had access to. Hmm. 
yeah, so as you, you mentioned, climate change is quite, quite worrying for the species. Um, now, David Allen has put in a comment in the chat feed saying, uh, very relevant that Spanish birds also nest on cliffs. So maybe the lack of tall trees in shrubby Mediterranean environments where uh, the colonization of Southern Africa um, might have also started as with the booted eagle and the white stalk. So perhaps David Allen has some ideas and, and can work on that problem. <laughs> Absolutely, David. We'll welcome some uh, fireside brainstorming. I think uh, you could be onto something there. Um, David, uh, sorry, <laughs> Andrew Marshall uh, asks: Do we have any idea how far these birds travel to forage in South Africa, and more specifically in the Western Cape? Andrew, great question. Um, I do not have an answer for you, unfortunately. Um, there was a Portuguese researcher who was looking to deploy tracking devices on our black stalks in the Western Cape. Um, I am not sure whether that project actually went ahead because I suspect it interfaced with the onset of COVID. Um, so to my knowledge, and please anybody in the chat room correct me, um, those tracking devices were never deployed, but it is absolutely crucial that we get a handle on the home ranges of these birds. There, there certainly does seem to be some local scale movements, particularly out of the likes of Mahobas Cliff um, down into the, the southern KZN and, and eastern Cape estuary systems. Um, Tarbiton mentioned it in his paper. I was lucky enough to, to see a flock of black stalks heading um, southwards in what was very clearly a large scale movement. Um, but they, we don't have a, an exact handle on just how far these birds go. They certainly do seem capable of being able to travel substantial distances. Um, but until we get that tracking data or even um, ringing data, which is going to require some uh, talented climbing ringers, um, it's not something that we have a, a concrete answer on in South Africa, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, tracking studies are so valuable to answering so many different questions. So hopefully that study and others can go ahead in the future. Um, Another interesting comment that I just picked up in the chat feed uh, from Lynette Rudman saying, uh, the farmers in Eastern Cape, Eastern Cape say they know a drought is coming when they see black stalks at their dams that are running dry. So another uh, link between the, how, how important these water resources are for the black stalks. Definitely. I think that's such a great point, Christina. And I always harp on in my other talks about birds being indicator species. And if you can learn to interpret what they're telling you by being present or absent in the landscape, you will have a much better handle on what's going on in the world. But uh, that's a very interesting, interesting notion, Lynette. And uh, hopefully we won't see any black stalks fishing out of their dams anytime soon in the Eastern Cape. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one. It's a bit... Uh, out of the realm of science, but Shashi Kassan asks whether you know why storks are associated with de delivering babies. I know that it's not the black storks that are, are, are kind of a uh, story to do that, but do you have any, any ideas? Sure, I'm, I'm going out <laughs> on a limb here, but I know it's the white stork that you're referring to, mm. Shashi, and they often uh, nest on the roofs of European houses and uh, I believe coincide with the arrival of spring and many new births and life. So I suspect um, the, the stalks coming in around springtime. I'm not 100% sure where the actual carrying of the baby came in at some point <laughs> in folklore, but I know there is, there is some history to that, which I can't remember off the top of my head now. But uh, we'll, we'll go with the onset of spring and the return of, of white stalks to the roofs as the, the bringers of new life. That sounds, that sounds like a sensible answer. Um, Sarah Charlton asks whether you can talk more on the impact of human presence on black, on black stalks, uh, saying some bird species seem so unaffected by human presence or indeed adapt to or learn to profit off of it. Uh, do you have any idea of what the particular impacts are, what they don't like about humans? Yeah, great question, Sarah, and I think a difficult one to answer, and definitely the cliff nesting birds seem to be far more susceptible to this disturbance than the tree nesters, um, be that because the, 
the if nesters are choosing to live in these very isolated, low human traffic areas um, because they're, they're not particularly a fay to the, the presence of humans. I can't, I can't answer beyond that, but it, it definitely is amazing to watch these winners and losers um, as humans expand into various landscapes. Having just driven down to the Cape, the, the prolific crows along the N1 highway and the very noticeable lack of things like secretary birds um, just speaks to that point, how certain species are adapting to us. And the reality is, as humans, we are the, the sixth mass extinction. We are the force that is driving that. And there will be species that cannot cope. We are certainly doing our best as the conservation society to give them the best chance. Um, but at the end of the day, when the pressure's on, some species are unfortunately going to run into trouble. And we'll hopefully do enough to try and support them as best we can. Um, and who knows where we'll be in the next thousand years, what evolutionary processes will have taken hold with those who have adapted to us and those who haven't. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know that uh, everyone at BirdLife and, and all our collaborators, we're doing, doing our best to try and help the, the ones who, who, who can't adapt as, uh, as well to our to human presence. So I think we'll just take one more question. It's, it's 20 past eight. Um, and that's another question from Rob Simmons, um, kind of looking further afield, asking whether you know what the conservation status of uh, black stalks elsewhere in Africa? Uh, Rob, good question. I don't, um, definitely not, not in Africa. Um, I suspect they are having challenges as are all our large um, terrestrial birds. But uh, unfortunately, I think Simi and the regional team are doing their best to try and help many of our African partners with their red listing processes. So hopefully in the next five years or so, we'll have a, a better handle on what is going on with species like the black stork in those other range states where they do occur. Um, but unfortunately, at the moment, not, not that well known. OK, thanks. Hopefully people can uh, learn from what you guys have done here and, and start gathering some data on that elsewhere in the continent. Definitely. Um, just briefly, before we, we close, um, we recently had our African bird fair uh, over the weekend. And I see there was a question um, asking about watching those uh, videos or those presentations from the, the bird fair um, for people who weren't able to join. And I believe that you can still register on EventMobi uh, and access those talks uh, for the next three months. Uh, so if you just go to the BirdLife South Africa website and, and look for the Bird Fair banner, then you can register and, and access those talks. I think that's correct. Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, no, that, that does sound correct, Christina. I'm not 100% sure about the paid talks. I think those might have mm -hmm. been closed down, but um, definitely all of the free content. There is some wonderful showcases from the likes of the Wits University Bird Lab, um, some of our top birders around South Africa sharing their anecdotes and uh, definitely lots of good content on there if you are a bird enthusiast and want to watch more about birds in South Africa and Africa definitely go check yeah. it out absolutely great well then I think we'll we'll leave it there thank you very much Melissa for for a great talk good to have you on as a presenter and uh, sharing your uh, stories about the black stalks and, and what is being done to, to try and find out more about them. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to, to say to end off. Yeah, just thank you, Christina. Um, and a big thank you to everyone for listening. Um, I hope you leave this talk uh, with a, a new appreciation for these elusive birds and will feel very lucky when you do encounter them out in the field. Please keep letting us know where you're seeing them. And if you do find a nest, let us know even more so mm -hmm. as we continue to try and, and grow our database and understanding of where they are. But thank you, everyone, and hope that you enjoyed that. Yeah, I certainly did. So thank you very much. And thanks very much to our audience for tuning in. And we'll see you next week for another Conservation Conversations. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks.